you can stare at me. All right. Oh, yeah, that's a much better idea. I like that much. Oh, and we are live. Hi, everybody. I'm Caroline Levitt, the co-founder of Mighty Blaze. And I am so thrilled and honored and excited to have one of my literary heroes, Kevin Brockmeyer, here. He's the author of A Brief History of the Dead. And I couldn't find my copy, but I just reordered it. This wonderful book, The Illumination, and his newest book, which is absolutely spectacular. And he's going to read from it for us. Let me get the cover and so you can see how beautiful it is. The Ghost Variations. It's a hundred tiny, troubling, unsettling stories about being haunted or hunting. So I want to read you some praise for Kevin first. Brockmeyer investigates our capacity for wonder. The result is exacting and perfectly strange. The New York Times said that. People talk about Brockmeyer in almost reverent tones. I honestly don't know anybody who doesn't. I certainly do. His work gets under the skin. It travels with you. And it also shows the possibilities of art. I first discovered Kevin's work with The Truth About Celia, which is just a, an astonishingly great book. And I immediately became obsessed with his one of his next books, the, A Brief History of the Dead, and then Illumination, where human pain transforms into light. Isn't that extraordinary, just hearing that? Don't you want to read it immediately? And of course, A Few Seconds of Radiant Film Strip, his memoir about seventh grade, which for many of us was the worst year we ever went through. His work has been translated into 18 languages. He's published his stories in such venues as The New Yorker, The Georgia Review, McSweeney's, Zoetrope, Tin House, The Oxford American, The Best American Short Stories, The Year's Best, Fantasy and Horror, and New Stories from the South. He's received the Borders Original Voices Award, three O. Henry Awards, one was a first prize, the Penn USA Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and an NEA grant. In 2007, he was named one of Granta's best young American novelists. He teaches frequently at Iowa Writers Workshop and lives in Little Rock, Arkansas, where he was raised. His latest is amazing. His picture of him. Whoops, I can never get it up right, sorry. The Ghost Variations. It's a hundred small ghost stories, not all of them with ghosts, but all of them haunted. The stories are contained within lists, ghosts and memories, ghosts and nations, ghosts and fortunes, ghosts and time, ghosts and love, so much more. I'm absolutely thrilled to host Kevin here today. Thank you so much, Kevin. Would you read for us one of the absolutely. stories? Yes. Um, so thank you to A Mighty Blaze for hosting me. Uh, thank you to Caroline for speaking with me. Um, you know, you're not only an extraordinary writer, but an extraordinary literary advocate. And I and many other people appreciate you for that work. Thank um, you. All right. So I'm going to begin by reading one very short story from The Ghost Variations. Uh, this is, as Caroline mentioned, a collection of 100 two-page stories, all of them involving ghosts, ghostliness, or the afterlife in one way or another. Uh, some of them more directly, some of them in just kind of sideways or glancing ways. Um, the one I'm going to read is one of the more direct ghost stories, not a frightening story, but in fact, a story about a ghost. Uh, and this is one that I've never read before, um, but I picked it out because a couple of readers have told me that it was one of their favorites in the book recently. And you know, when you're writing a book of 100 stories, you don't necessarily know which ones are going to speak to the most right, people. Right. Um, but this one happened to speak to a couple of people who have uh, talked to me. Um, so it's number 28 in the book and it's called The Whirl of Time. The ghost resided in a country full of clocks. Some of the clocks were trees methodically adding rings to their trunks. Some of the clocks were breezes, marking out a moment or two by ruffling the grass or churning the curtains. And some of the clocks were people, their hearts pumping out the seconds. Behind the entire living world was the drum of time passing. And silently, from his gap in the air, the ghost listened as it rushed along. He had been a ghost for as long as he could remember. Ever since an enormous pain he could barely recollect had ended his life in the mud and the rain. Since then, from his perspective, the years had gone by in a ceaseless barrage, 
replacing the generations just as swiftly as it created them. Children became parents and grew old and took to their beds, and then the beds were empty. Streets, fences, buildings, and monuments crumbled and melted back into the earth. Who could possibly keep track of it all? Who would try? Ghosts are meant to fix themselves to one particular house, meadow, or street corner, to select a place and haunt it. It is this tenacity of attention that keeps them from coasting through the centuries like herons over water. But this particular ghost had never developed the knack for standing still. So the material world went less and less, meant less and less to him. Eventually, when the clocks of everything became too loud in his ears, he resolved to bring his flight to a stop. First, he chose a dwelling to haunt, a small post and beam house on a hill beside a market square. The whirl of time took it down, though, before he could steady himself there. Next, he chose a person to haunt, a young teacher instructing her first geometry students. He had hardly shown her his countenance, though, before she retired and was bones in a graveyard. Houses were too ephemeral, he decided, and people were like raindrops. Finally, he chose a stone to haunt, one of the oldest and most immovable in the city. Gradually, through an effort of will, he was able to move beneath its surface. A stone keeps its own time, and soon enough, haunting it, the ghost did too. To his relief and surprise, the time he found himself sharing with the stone was less precipitate, more measured. From the crack in its side, he watched the flicker of the seasons slow. The fields stopped boiling with flowers. The clouds began to cotton the sky. It was cool and quiet inside the stone. After a while, he ceased to hear the ticking of the trees, grass, breezes, and hearts. Whole days and nights went by when he forgot he was a ghost at all. He imagined he was only the large brown mass of granite resting imperturbably in the city park. The stone where the bugs no longer landed. The stone that the children no longer climbed. That was absolutely, forgive the pun, haunting. Thank it you. Was, uh, the language is so precise and so poetic and so beautiful. And it actually, I believe it makes us almost yearn to be haunted. Mm -hmm. or to do the haunting in some profound way. So I want, I always want to ask authors, what was, again, I'm sorry about the word haunting, but what was haunting you into writing this book? What was it you wanted to know that you hoped would show itself through your writing? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the first thing I was curious about um, was uh, the formal constraint of the book. Um, I decided I was going to write a book of 100 very short stories, all of them roughly the same length. I knew that before I knew anything else. Um, but very quickly thereafter, I decided that the ideal, an ideal kind of organizing mechanism for the book um, was ghosts. Uh, it, I realized that there were a number of stories that intrigued me already that I had not yet written involving ghostliness, many of which were suited to the very short form. And I just had the idea that if I situated that notion at the center of the book, um, I would be able to, let's say I had six stories to begin with, I would be able to come up with another 94. <laughs> All of <the> <laughs> Also, which pleased me in one way or another. <laughs> um, so as you know, um, I've always been interested in the afterlife as mm -hmm. sort of uh, a, a space for conducting fantasy. Um, the Brief History of the Dead largely rose out of that fascination. Um, and it's a fascination that's lingered with me. And I thought I could apply it to this material as well. 
as it turned out, there were any number of other obsessions that I just happened to possess that <laughs> um, took the page, like w without any real effort on my part. So, I mean, I've got an interest in, interest in time and how it can be reimagined. Um, I have an interest in animals, um, an interest in luck and the lack of it, uh, an interest in childhood. Um, and, you know, all of these were themes that just kind of embedded themselves in these stories um, in ways that I wasn't even fully realizing until I had finished writing the book. Okay. Are ghosts strictly a metaphor for you? Or do you believe that they're just might be ghosts? I even am. Quantum, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, even in a quantum physics sort of way, where quantum physics says the universe is far more odd than we can ever imagine. Well, that's what I actually believe, that yeah, everything me too. is far odder than we can imagine. Um, uh, you know, I'm an agnostic about all the profound metaphysical questions, and even about the deepest scientific questions that we're not anywhere close to answering. Um, chief among both of them being why there is something, anything at all, rather than right. nothing. Um, and I feel the same way about ghosts. I've never had an experience with a ghost. Um, I would love to, <laughs> you know, I would, have, I would love to be, um, I, went in. <laughs> I, would, I would love to be inhabiting the kind of life, uh, that would permit that experience. Um, but so far I haven't been, um, Inhabit is a, a funny word for me to have realized I just used uh, because there's a particular novel I enjoy by Donald Harrington called With, and it is his ghost novel, but he doesn't call them ghosts. He calls them inhabits. Uh, mm -hmm. and these are kind of, you know, beings that linger in the spaces that were meaningful to them when they were younger, whether or not they have since gone on to pass away or conduct the rest of their lives. You know, one of the things that I love so much, uh, both in a, both in the brief history of the dead and in the ghost storybook, is that the dead don't have the answers. Nobody has the answers. Even in the illumination, nobody really knows for sure why something is happening, only that it's happening and what are we to make of it. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what's your worldview as you're going through life? I mean, what is it like to to be you, are you always sort of wondering or waiting or hoping for something unexplained and unexpected beside ghostly visitations to arrive? Uh, you know, I think I have the kind of imagination that's open to the fantastic. Um, and when, I mean, the world does not frequently present me with the fantastic. It presents me with unusual synchronicities every so often. So unusual that they almost seem fantastic to me. Um, but even when it's not offering up uh, kind of subjects for fantasy, that is how my brain uh, kind of turns toward things anyway. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's because it, there's something just so wonderfully realistic about your work that mm -hmm. it's, it's hard sometimes to tell people when I tell them, oh, it's like a hundred ghost stories and people say, oh, I love to be scared. And I had to say, no, 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 no. It, that's not the kind of haunting that's going on here. This is a very different book and this is why you should read it. And then I got them sort of, in, I got them really interested in it. So I wanna also talk about your website, which is, which I love your web, your website is hilarious and wonderful and really quirky. And it's got all these lists, just mm -hmm. like you have all the lists in this book. You have like the 50 favorite songs. I love the songs that are most likely to make you cry immediately, yeah. <laughs> whatever. How did you come up with these lists and why? And have you always been a list maker? I what does that always, do for you? Yes, I've always been a list maker. Um, I, I want to take a quick step back, however, before sure. I answer that and say very briefly that when I was writing this book, deep in the process, I realized that if I was going to produce a book of 100 ghost stories and none of them were frightening, I was going to have some just. <laughs> readers. So there are maybe 10 or a dozen stories in the book that I think, hope, are actually horrifying. Um, but uh, back to back to your, your question about the lists. Just two nights ago, um, some friends asked me whether I had loved the Guinness Book of World Records when I was a kid. And of course, I found it very interesting. But my answer was that what I really loved 
was the book of lists. And, and like this was a similar <laughs> endeavor. And I think even when I was very little, like it, the idea of a list seemed <laughs> somehow kind of uh, playful, both playful and necessary to me. So if I was reading a list of 20 something or others, um, it felt like uh, it was exhilarating to me to watch that list complete itself. And I think I would have felt crestfallen if it had reached 18 and stopped. <laughs> You know, it just, it seemed like an important thing to be doing, like an important organizing principle for the world. Um, I began keeping these uh, kind of tidier lists of my own. Well, I mean, I was always making lists, uh, you know, dating back to my childhood, but I began keeping them in a more public way shortly after I started publishing um, because I would give readings and I would always get the question, what are your favorite books? And Afterwards, I would always chastise myself for having forgotten to mention a certain few of them. Right. Um, so I made this list of my 50 favorite books, uh, alphabetical by author, with no more than one book per author, and with asterisks beside my top 10. Um, and I would update this whenever it seemed necessary to update it. Uh, but 50 fit very nicely on a single sheet of paper. And so I would just distribute it at readings whenever I got that question, like as a list of book recommendations. And it grew from there. Um, so I began keeping lists of movies and albums and children's books and uh, science fiction and fantasy, comics and graphic novels. And I always knew that if ever I got around some two decades after I should have to instituting a website for myself, I would have a section that was dedicated to these lists. And it, it has grown and grown. I established the website, I suppose, in September of 2020. And I'm up to list number 280 right now. <laughs> so it's, it's, some of them like, are very, you know, minute and dedicated to like particular interests of mine. Oh no, I just vanished. Do you still hear me? Oh, here I am again. Okay, yeah. yeah, the lists are hilarious, absolutely hilarious. And, you know, everybody should really go to Kevin Brookmeyer's website and look at them because it's so much fun and it also gets you thinking of your own, you know, your own list, like your 50 favorite pasta dishes or whatever else you want to do. And it's actually very, very re revealing. So, in going back to lists, I want to go back to your childhood. Um, when did you discover the fantastic in life? How old were you? Um, and is there a demarcation? Well, actually, never mind. The second thing is a different question. Tell us about you as a kid. Okay. Were you afraid of stuff? Or did you want to risk stuff that was out of the world? Um, hmm. I, well, let's see. Um, I was interested in magic, I suppose. Um, I was interested in stories that were magical. Um, when I was 10 years old, for instance, uh, my favorite book was Alan Mendelssohn, The Boy from Mars by Daniel Pinkwater. <laughs> do you know Daniel Pinkwater? Yes, it's, yes, it's I do. Daniel Pinkwater book. <laughs> okay. Um, it remains one of my favorite books to this day. Um, and I guess I was interested in ways in which uh, what I thought of as ordinary life could be disrupted by the strange, the magic, or the fantastic. Um, uh, you know, I suppose I was slightly disappointed that that didn't happen all the time because it seemed, it always felt to me as if the world were ready to crack open and reveal the magic that was hidden inside of it. Um, and I just kind of waited for that to happen. Um, yeah, I feel that way sometimes too. Did you, did you write as a little kid? I did. Um, you did? Oh, do you remember any of the stories? I still own many of the stories, yes. Oh, wow. um, so I grew up, um, you know, as soon as I was, say, seven years old and capable of stringing a sentence together on paper for myself, I began writing stories. Uh, just when there was nothing happening in class, when I had finished my work, that's what I would do. Pull out a sheet of notebook paper and write. Uh, and back then, I, I mean, I didn't know that I was going to grow up and write professionally. Um, but I knew I loved books as much as I loved anything else. Uh, so when I was very young, I was writing mystery stories, detective stories, and I was always the detective. <laughs> it's totally transparent. Like I was the hero in these stories. One of my classmates would vanish. I would solve the crime. 
everybody was flawed. <laughs> so this is <laughs> this was my idea of you know what storytelling was all about when I was that age. Uh, that, did people encourage you? Did they say, "Oh my God, you're going to be a writer"? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they no, did. I, I okay. had encouraging teachers and encouraging classmates. Um, and, you know, I kept writing these mystery stories into uh, kind of seventh grade, I suppose, and then started writing stories of other types. So because everything you write seems so incredibly real to me, and it does to all the critics who love your work as well, it, feel, it all feels impossibly true. Is there a demarcation between what you're writing when you're writing it and your real life? Do you believe these things are another reality and that you're inhabiting them while you're writing them? Well, they linger in my subconscious and I continue okay. to think about them and they accrue material in the back of my mind, even when I'm not sitting in front of the computer or in front of the page. Um, I do, I am able to distinguish though between the writing I'm doing on the page and what's happening in my imagination. Uh, so I'm never actually lost in the world of my fiction. Um, and I think that's largely because I write so incrementally. Um, okay. I, I think of myself, I'm not a sloppy first draft writer. I'm a very slow sentence maker. Um, and uh -huh. I, I feel as if I cannot, uh, abandon a sentence to the page if it seems ugly, clumsy, or incorrect to me. Um, so I work my way from the beginning to the end of a story or even a novel very, very gradually, moment by moment and sentence by sentence, allowing every sentence to insinuate or demand the sentences that follow. Um, okay. uh, it, it, so like the actual craft of writing for me uh, is not... Uh, kind of finding myself swept away by narrative. Um, it's immersing myself in the tiny little language puzzles of any given cluster of sentences and trying to perfect them. Um, so that's what writing actually looks like for me. Uh, okay. Occasionally, I'll find myself kind of taken with an idea and uh, uh, not all of the sentence work of a story, but the entire narrative architecture of a story will come to me fully born. Um, but oftentimes that stuff is kind of worked out uh, in the in the writing for me. Okay, you you said something really interesting in an interview where you said you like to imagine your way into the truth. That really stuck with me. Tell us how this works, and how can we know? How can we or you know if you are in the truth? Do you is that something you feel? I think that's all that it is. You, I mean, you can't know. Uh, that you're in the truth, but you can know when you've said something that seems close to the center of your own experience to you. You know when you're saying something that is, I, I would go so far as to say, dangerously true. Um, there's, uh, Caroline, I'm sure you've read and love William Maxwell. But oh, yeah. You must. Like, he's a wonderful, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's wonderful a writer. Wonderful, wonderful writer. Um, he, he, one of his masterpieces is a very short novel called So Long, See You Tomorrow. It's roughly 100 A great title, years. too. Yes. Uh, there's an essay by Charles Baxter about William Maxwell and that book. And he says that you get the sense reading this very short autobiographical novel that Maxwell has given away more of what's most intimate to himself than authors often do in novels of many, many hundreds of pages. So for me, what feels like the truth is when I realize that I've given something away that's profoundly intimate to me. Um, that's extraordinary. I love that. That's extraordinary to say that. I think that's true. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, I didn't have much more to say about that, like other than that you, you know when something means so much to you that you're not willing to get it wrong on the page because it matters that much. It seems like a moral failing, like not only an aesthetic failing, but a moral failing because the material is something you value so much and because what the material is speaking to you and maybe the other human beings about whom in veiled ways it's speaking uh, are of such profound value to you. I would love for you to read something else for us and people out there listening, if you could post your questions and comments to Kevin, I'm sure he would be delighted to answer those. Kevin, please read us another one of your wonderful stories. Yes. Um, so uh, I have not chosen this one ahead of time. When I was 
when I'm writing when I'm writing any book, I often have a totem object of some kind on my desk uh, that remains there from the very beginning to the very end. In the case of this book, it was this thing here. Oh, it that's is great! A hundred sided die, uh, a spherical hundred sided die called a zaki hedron. Um, oh. It's roughly the size of a golf ball, uh, but it's hollowed out and it's got grains or beans or something like that inside of it to give it a little friction so that when you roll it, it won't just keep rolling forever. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that what I would do is just roll the die and see what number it gives me and read that story. Uh, so we'll see. Okay. All right. Number 37. All right, this is another one I have not yet read. Uh, it's called The Prism. It was meant to be a sort of cosmological prism, a lens through which they could view the universe dispersing into its thousands of parallel possibilities. But when the scientists powered it up, it didn't work. Nine years of labor and hundreds of millions of dollars wasted. The project's director stalked around the armature of the machine like a hyena circling its prey. This dumb, damned, broken thing, he said, and launched a kick at it. The discharge from the transformer killed instantly. Later, reviewing the lab recording, his team watched the whole grim episode in slow motion. The director yawing around to fire his leg out his cheap plastic shoe melting off his foot, a corona of sparks wavering above his head. But then, when they scanned the secondary footage, taken through the lens of the prism, something else, his ghost leaving his body. A ghost, they called it, and a ghost it unmistakably was, the classic Halloween kind all transparent drapery emanating from a featureless white globe, like a lollipop wrapped in tissue paper. It leapt from the director's chest and vanished into the ceiling. Several months passed before they obtained permission to transport the machine to a penitentiary and aim it at an inmate who was receiving his lethal injection. Sure enough, at the very moment the EKG stopped tracing its pinnacles, a ghost could be seen fleeing the poor man's body. Hypothesis, prediction, experiment, conclusion. They had not invented a cosmological prism. Instead, it seemed, they had invented a window into the spirit world. Yet afterward, examining the footage, they saw something very strange one of the guards shedding a ghost of his own. He was locking the execution chamber when his knees wobbled and he brought a hand to his chest. He did not die. Even so, a ghost came spilling out of his body. The next week in the lab, the camera accidentally captured an intern stumbling over his ankles. He came inches from cleaving his head open against the edge of an aluminum cabinet, but did not do so. He had, in fact, already regained his balance by the time his ghost sprang loose. So then, a new hypothesis. The prism was capable of observing not merely the one actual death of a person, but the thousands of parallel possible deaths. With every icy sidewalk crossed, every heartbeat skipped, every near miss on the highway, you expelled another ghost into the atmosphere. Imagine how many billions of them there must be. Trillions. Surely from outer space, at any given moment, the world must be bristling with ghosts like a porcupine. And Caroline, you mentioned quantum physics, and it's, yes, that's my favorite thing that I read that particular story. I think <laughs> yes, I love that. I I do think that quantum physics. Um, I think that's why I'm so drawn to your work because it does offer sort of a 
a very realistic view that the world is indeed stranger than we can imagine. And there are things that we don't know. And a lot of these woo-woo type things probably yeah. can be explained by science. Yes. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, and that's sort of what I'm always looking for. So you also said in an interview, which I loved because I feel the same way, that your days were not that much different during the pandemic, <laughs> that you were in your home, writing, working, talking to people. Um, I personally am always worried about having lost any social skills and abilities that I ever developed when I was out in the world. Mm. Um, do you feel that way or is that not even a concern of yours? <laughs> Well, I mean, social awkwardness is always a concern of mine. <laughs> it's a profoundly <laughs> lifelong concern of mine. Um, you know, I'm I'm unnerved, I suppose, by other people until suddenly I begin to perceive them as friends. Or, um, you know, I mean, suddenly you realize that you love people and you're comfortable right. with them. Like, that's what it demands, really. Um, and even people that you know well, if you spend enough time out of their company, you can forget that you love them. It takes a moment to rediscover that. Um, it can, at least. Yeah, That's a lovely sentiment. That's a really lovely sentiment. Okay, so I have another question. I have to write it down. Oh, yeah, so many of your books are about longing. You know, mm -hmm. the longings we have for community, for understanding. And I think you've taken this even deeper by exploring what we don't understand. Do you think that we will ever, so no, maybe not in our lifetimes, but say if you go to the year 3500, do you think we'll ever understand how things work? And if we do, do you think it'll be disappointing for us? Do you think we need that longing? Um, I think we do need a kind of longing, but I don't think our longing is ever going to be fulfilled. So we don't need to worry about losing it. <laughs> uh, I, think there, I think there are questions that are simply unanswerable. Um, among them, the one we discussed earlier, why is there something or anything at all rather than nothing? Um, right. You know, okay. we're not going to, I don't see how we can approach answering that question. Um, I would love to travel to the world, to the world of 3,500 and, and Me see too. what we've discovered. Um, it, you know, um, there, there are a number of time travel stories in this book. Um, one of them, in fact, uh, my, my mother's favorite, very specific subgenre of fiction is the time travel romance with um, a happy ending. Wow. Years, she's been asking me to write a story of that type. And so I wrote a story of that type for this book. Um, her imagination directs her into the past when she fantasizes about time travel. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, it directs me into the future. Yeah, my, my, I'm always thinking in terms of the future. Do you ever go on YouTube and <laughs> look at those cheesy videos about time travelers from the future who supposedly took photographs of themselves here? I, I At least once I've stumbled across <laughs> one of those videos. I didn't find it very convincing, alas. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, another of the lists you'll find on the web page, there are several that are dedicated to time travel, like my 20 favorite time travel novels, my 20 favorite time travel movies. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, Tom is telling us that you have a question that is okay. really long, but cool. Okay. Leslie Harris says, have you kept these lists throughout your life or have you recently just started to compile them for the purpose of the website? Uh, it's a combination of the two. There are certain lists that I've always, like this is one of the ways that I just walk through my days. Suddenly I'll realize that I've got to decide for myself what the 10 best Prince songs are. For <laughs> you know, and there's no real life necessity here, but I've got to get it done. Um, so now <laughs> I have a place to archive lists like that. Um, some of them were generated just for the purposes of the website. And occasionally I get questions, usually from former students, um, asking if I can tell them about books of a certain type that they might read in order to assist whatever work they're doing. Um, okay. And I use the website as a place to produce these lists for their edification and for anybody else's. The lists are wonderful. Oh, here's another one from Aaron Berry. We've all heard the dreaded notion, there's nothing new under the sun. How do you avoid the mental morass that creeps into your mind when you start writing and consider that you're about to attempt to offer something new to the world? In other words, do you ever worry that what you're writing is rehash? What do you do to ensure you're trying something different? I guess I would say two things about that. Um, one of them is that I think 
books are often in intimate conversation with other books. Um, and that's been the case with nearly everything I've written. Uh, you know, it's also in conversation with my own life, life and with my imagination, but it's in conversation in part with what I've read. And I don't worry overly much about feeling that my books um, speak to the concerns of other books. Um, in fact, I'm pleased when that happens. Uh, I would like to think that my ideal readership are readers who love the same books that I love. Um, in addition to that, there's a, a quotation, you'll find another of the lists you'll find on the website is a list of 50 quotations about writing. Um, this is something that I began to generate when I taught and I would just hand it out at the beginning of each semester uh, and kind of read it off to my students. And here we go. This is from J.G. Ballard, who's a meaningful writer for me. He says, presumably all obsessions are extreme metaphors waiting to be born. That whole private mythology in which I believe totally is a collaboration between one's conscious mind and those obsessions that one by one present themselves as stepping stones. Um, I believe that your obsessions are important and are probably what you actually have something to say about. So it's not unusual to see writers whose obsessions manifest themselves in book after book across the course of an entire career. Um, and I don't think that's anything to feel ashamed of. Great answer. Yeah. Oh, at what age did you write your first ghost story? What was it about? Okay. Uh, it was not as a child. Uh, it was very late. Uh, I told Caroline before we took the screen um, that... I did not watch horror movies when I was growing up. Um, I, I was very sensitive to fright. Uh, I could literally become sick with fear. Um, and in fact, when I was nine years old uh, at a Cub Scout meeting, our den mother showed us The Shining one Halloween. And <laughs> <laughs> this was, I spent weeks, you know, sort of turning my bedroom off, bedroom light off, and then <laughs> touching the carpet before I was kind of tucked under my covers because I was. <laughs> that something, something with an ax was going to get me. But I did not write stories like that when I was growing up. Um, I would suppose that the first one of those I wrote is in its own, uh, in a way, part of the truth about Celia, which Caroline mentioned earlier. There's Wonderful a book. Section, thank you. And that's a book about, it's, it purports to be written by a man who has a background as a science fiction writer, but in real life, his daughter has disappeared. And he's writing these stories as a way to come to terms with that loss and to imagine alternate lives for her. One of the stories he writes um, involves, there are a couple of ghost stories in that book, um, but one of them involves his daughter befriending a boy named Travis Worley, whom she does not immediately realize, but comes to realize is a ghost and sort of pursuing him into the ghostly world and therefore vanishing into it. Um, I've written a couple of children's novels. And one of the questions I always got when I visited elementary school classes is, have you ever written a ghost story? Like it, for what I, I, you would also get what kind of car do you drive? <laughs> do you like skateboarding? Like you get particular <laughs> weird questions. From kids. But that was one I always got. And I, I'm pleased now that if I visit an elementary school classroom again, I'll be able to tell them, yes. Like I, <laughs> I've written a book of 100 ghost stories. Um, and a few of them are even appropriate for children. Most of them are not probably, but. Hey, I'm intrigued by your comment about things being dangerously true. Can you give some examples in your writing? Oh, that's a good question. Yes. Um, so I, maybe I would I would turn to two pieces of writing. Um, it, first of all, I'll say that whether or not a piece of writing is obviously autobiographical, when it's at its best, it's somehow emotionally autobiographical. It's speaking yes. to the most important material of your own life. Yes. Most of my writing is fantasy of one kind or another. Um, like it could, it plainly could not have happened to me. But that doesn't mean that it's not filled to the brim with the intimacies of my own life. Um, so to give you two examples, The Illumination, which Caroline mentioned earlier, is a book about people who are in pain. Um, and that arose out of a period of my own life, uh, a decade long, um, 
when I was just enduring physical difficulties of one kind or another, um, which uh, left me incapacitated in all sorts of ways. And when something like that happens to you, it's impossible not to think at some point, what good is this? Like, how can it possibly benefit me or the world or anybody for me to be mired in this circumstance? Um, when I was having thoughts like that, a, a, a notion occurred to me, which was, what if the purpose of our pain is that it's what makes us beautiful? Um, and even more explicitly through a religious lens, although I'm an agnostic, what if the purpose of our pain is that it's what makes us beautiful to God? What would that mean? Like, and is that a comforting idea or is it a frightening idea? And along with that came this um, image of somebody who was in so much suffering that he was generating light. Uh, and it was that equation, basically, pain equals light equals beauty that gave birth to the entire book. It would not have been written if it weren't for me trying to grapple with an experience that was of fundamental importance to me. The other piece I would mention is a short story I wrote called Andrea is Changing Her Name. Um, and it's one of the few short stories I've written that is fairly explicitly autobiographical. Um, although it's very weird. There's a first person <laughs> narrator who's an awful lot like me, but for most of the story's length, it adopts the third person perspective of this other character, Andrea, who is a fictional representation of a girl I once knew. Um, about whom I was totally mad when I was about 18 years old. Um, and, uh, you know, who, who was one of the most important people in my world um, and whom I was never quite able to tell that to. Uh, so that story was a way of trying to say that on the page and also to inhabit her perspective and try to imagine what it would have been like to be her during the span of time when we knew each other. Um, and that's a story that, again, like is born out of a real intimacy and I think has spoken to a lot of other readers because of that. I think that's really smart what you said, because I, I always tell my writing students that, you know, because a lot of them want to write like whatever is best selling out there. And I always tell them that you will find the universal when you go inside and do the particular, the particular, find what is haunting you emotionally. That's what you need to write about. So we have time for one more question, Tom. Do we have another one? Oh, is there one story from the new book that you feel closest to or speaks to you more? Why that story? Okay. Uh, well, there are so many stories in the book. And one of the things I've been discovering as I do these events and read from the book out loud is that some of them um, just have more resonance when I present them than I realized they would. You know, it's interesting. Yeah, you produce them yeah. and you have to move on to whatever comes next if you're trying to produce a book of 100 short stories. Um, but among the stories in this book that are most meaningful to me personally, uh, there's one called Knees, uh, which is about um, like a middle-aged gentleman who realizes that a girl he once loved has, loved has passed away. And uh, she sort of haunts him over the course of this story. Um, that was a story that is not like actually based in anything that happened to me, but is also rooted in the same kind of emotional particularities that gave birth to Andrea is changing her name, that particular story. Um, there's a story, I don't know why it speaks to me, but there's a story in the book called Parakeets that I think is the most frightening story in the book, perhaps. Uh, and I like it for that reason. Um, there's a less traditionally frightening story called Numbers, in which there's a character who realizes that he's always got a tally of numbers running through his head for his entire life. He doesn't know where they come from. Um, they will skip from kind of the billions down to the thousands, like he never knows what's going on. And then he passes away, becomes a ghost, realizes he's locked into the posture that he adopted when he died and that he will be counting for eternity. Um, you know, and he begins all of a sudden, one, two, three, four at the end of the story. Uh, and for somebody who has like even a trace of obsessive compulsive disorder, I think this is a very horrifying prospect. 
Um, so those are a few of the stories that speak the most intimately to me. I also want to ask you, I ask this of all writers because I'm so obsessive myself, what's obsessing you now and why? Um, hmm. um, okay, well, I've been thinking very recently, I guess I'll say a couple of unusually specific things. Um, there's a writer uh, I... I know a little bit uh, in whose work I appreciate named Yi Yun Li. Um, and she speaks frequently about this idea of shadow stories, that every story you tell has got the material, its surface material, but underneath it, unaddressed and offering it more depth and resonance is something else that's also participating in the material, which is its shadow story. So I was asking myself, I was thinking about the Bible and wondering, does the Bible have a shadow story? Um, mm. And my theory right now is that the shadow story of the Bible is that it's a book about a God who changed and what it took for a God to change. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that idea. Um, something else altogether. Uh, I was playing a game with a friend of mine, like a little verbal preference game. Um, it, where you present somebody with a couple of words and they just tell you which one they like better. And you don't always know why you like the word better that you do, but right. almost instantaneously you can choose one. And then it's interesting to figure out why you made the choice you did. Two of the words she gave me were frog and bubble. And I love both of these words and they both feel to me like words that belong intimately to what they name, as if these were Adam and Eve words, you know? Um, I decided that I liked frog better. Um, in the reason I think, I, I puzzled it through, and I think the reason I made that choice um, was because if a frog is contained by the word frog, and if a bubble is contained by the word bubble, and in both cases it feels true to me, then somehow I might be capable of doing injury to the frog by choosing the bubble instead. Um, and this is, That's this is lunacy, you know, is what That's it really is. Um, but I think what was happening in my head when I was making that choice. Um, and I, if there, I don't know that there's a lesson to be offered there other than that most of the writers whose work I love best, it does seem to me that they have that uh, you know, weirdly um, close relationship with words and are mm -hmm. always kind of making artistic choices that rely on the associations with words that they would have trouble articulating, but that are nonetheless real. That is wonderful. So I want to tell everybody again, this is the book. It's absolutely a wonderful local bookstore. And uh, I want to thank Kevin Brockmeyer for being here so, so much. You have no idea how excited I was to talk to you. And talking to you makes me more excited to talk to you the next time. So thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for being here. Thank everybody for being out there. Please don't forget, whoops, this book or any of his other, any of other Kevin Brockmeyer's books are just superb. Thank you all. This will be recorded. It will be on the Mighty Blaze YouTube station, and you can also rewatch it on Facebook. That's it. Bye. Yeah, this was